Welcome back, everyone, and welcome back to myself. I am back from Tennessee, where I spent a couple of awesome days on the Shiloh Battlefield. Got to meet a whole bunch of fans of this channel, and if you were one of those folks who came, thank you for taking the time. We had people who came from Delaware and uh, Illinois and Missouri and uh, it, Ohio. It was just really, really cool uh, to see how far people came because of their shared love of history. And we got to spend a great afternoon together and a bunch of us had dinner that night. Uh, and then I drove back in a tornado. So good times. Uh, I'll tell, tell you more about that trip uh, and that event and what can you, you can expect from it in the coming days. I'm going to be doing another unboxing video because I arrived back from Tennessee to several more packages from you, the viewers, and I'm excited to open those and share with you what was sent to me. But for now, we're going to dive back in to the raid on Harper's Ferry. This is part four of Extra History's John Brown series. If you have not seen the first three parts of this, there's a link in the description to take you back to the beginning, as well as to the original content I highly encourage you uh, to support Extra History and the great content they're putting out. And they are fans of this channel. And every time I do a new series, they take the time to come over and say hi uh, in a comment in one of the videos. So I appreciate their support as well. Let's make sure we're giving them as much support as they give us. Let's go ahead and dive into part four. Pennsylvania, August 19th, 1859. Frederick Douglass meets John Brown in the empty quarry, bringing along his friend Shields Green, an escaped slave who has lived with Douglass for a year as a bodyguard. Brown, in disguise, tells them that his operation is almost ready. He has men in position near Harper's Ferry, ready to raid the Federal Arsenal and take hostages. Harriet Tubman will also alert nearby slaves to join the uprising. But what he needs now is Douglass's help to rally and inspire those recruits. So we hear a lot about the Harper's Ferry Raid in school. Growing up, you learn about the causes of the Civil War, and there's at least some mention of John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, but you don't hear about the involvement of some such prominent African Americans as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. But they are both connected to this, and it's pretty fascinating. And it, it makes it... It shows that this was less of, you know, a lot of people have the attitude that John Brown kind of, this was just kind of like a on the whim thing where he just kind of was throwing something up against the wall and hope it's, hoped it stuck. Uh, no, this was more calculated. This was more planned than that. There was at least some plan in place to try and cause this to spread and make it a larger uprising. So it, it was, there was more intelligence and thought behind it than I think some people realize. Douglas tries to reason with Brown. It's a perfect steel trap, John, he says. The Virginians will massacre them, and the public won't support an attack on the federal government. After an argument, Douglas turns to leave, but Brown, heartbroken, wraps his old friend in a bear hug. Come with me, Douglas, he begs. Douglas says no, but Shields Green feels differently. Mm. So leaving Douglas behind, Green now goes to join Brown's revolution. So you can understand why a guy like Shields Green would do this, right? You know, if you are a freedman, uh, somebody who's escaped slavery, or you're even somebody who was born free, but you see the plight of other uh, African Americans who are in bondage, uh, you want to do something, right? And you want to fight, but there's, it's not like during the Civil War where you can enlist in the Union cause and you can actually serve in the army. Uh, your options for how you can fight this and do something are very limited. And so when a guy like John Brown comes along and offers an opportunity, however much of a long shot it might be, it's something that you're gonna to wanna to be a part of. This John Brown series was chosen by our awesome patrons over on Patreon. And if you wanna have a say in the historical topics that we actually make shows about, stay tuned until after the episode. For three years, John Brown prepared for his Virginia operation. He bought rifles and pikes, paid for by the Secret Six, a clandestine group of New Englanders willing to fund operations against the South. He hired an English mercenary, a veteran of the Italian revolutions, to help him design his plot, and he studied the Nat Turner Revolt, Garibaldi's campaigns in Italy, and the American and Haitian revolutions. So let's take a minute and talk a little bit about the Nat Turner Revolt, because this is a excellent uh, precursor in a very similar location that gives you an indication of what John Brown was looking at wanting to do. 
So this takes place in 1831. It's known as the Nat Turner Rebellion and Nat Turner Re Revolt. And there's actually been a movie that was made about this a few years ago. Uh, Nat Turner was pretty well educated, especially for uh, an enslaved person. He could read. Uh, he was a very fiery preacher, very excellent orator from all indications. And he gets sold around a few times. And by 1831, he decides that he's going to try and organize some kind of a rebellion and uprising for slaves uh, and it doesn't get well planned or well thought out it just kind of happens uh, they end up killing 55 white people including women and children uh, and eventually he is able to hide out and is captured and i think there were like a little more than a dozen people that ended up being executed uh, because of this. Uh, yeah, he got about 75 enslaved people to uh, get involved in this. Uh, before all was said and done, something like 200 people uh, died because of this in reprisals uh, against uh, the enslaved people and against free blacks in the area. Uh, and a lot of people argued that this actually set back the cause of emancipation because remember, Virginia is kind of a northern state of the southern states and the the strength of uh slavery is not as powerful there as it is in the deep south and what we call the cotton states where slave labor was much more vital to the production of cotton it wasn't so much the case in virginia and so a lot of people argue that maybe virginia goes a different way i don't know if that's the case or not because i think it was pretty strongly entrenched there too but uh, so that's what he's referring to. But it wasn't well organized. And so if you are John Brown, you're looking at that and you're thinking, how can I avoid the mistakes that were made by Nat Turner and not have the same result? And the plan he came up with was simple. Seize the armory at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, and hold it. Tubman would spread the word of the revolt, causing enslaved people in the area to flock to Brown's banner. Then they would arm themselves from the federal stocks and retreat to the mountains to start a guerrilla war against slavery. Brown even carried out a dry run of the raid, successfully striking into Missouri to liberate 11 enslaved people and conveying them to Canada. However, the death of a slaveholder, shot when he pulled a revolver, turned public sentiment against Brown. And you have to remember the location. Harper's Ferry is not that far from Washington, D.C. It's not that far from some of the largest population, population centers in the country. So there's a lot more U.S. Army troops in the area that can quickly respond to this, and that's what ends up happening. And he'd even written a provisional constitution for those who joined his revolt, one that granted full rights regardless of race or gender. The document had been ratified and adopted during a largely black constitutional convention in the free black enclave of Ontario, Canada. Yet the one thing he could not find after three years of recruiting was actually more raiders. As of now, he'd only convinced 21 men to join. Young and idealistic, only two of them were over 30. Three were his sons, Watson, Owen, and Oliver, and five of them were black. Shields Green, who had escaped slavery, Lewis Sheridan Leary, who was born free in Oberlin, Ohio, to an Irish father and a mixed-race mother. And Oberlin, Ohio is up here in the northern part of the state, and uh, it's known as kind of a place that had a lot of what were then very liberal ideas, right? Oberlin's going to be the first college that's going to allow women to attend um, in a mixed gender situation with men and women. So um, pretty big deal. And so you can see why people would be coming from a place like Oberlin. John Anthony Copeland Jr., who had helped break a man out of prison after slave catchers arrested him. Osborne Perry Anderson, who is a freeborn printer and abolitionist. And Dangerfield Newby, what a who name. joined out of desperation. As a freed slave, he'd saved $1,500 to buy his wife and children from his former slaveholder, only to have the man raise the price. He needed to save his family. They all gathered at the Kennedy Farm, a secluded house and barn along the Maryland-Virginia border that Brown rented as a staging ground and for arms storage. Along with them was Brown's daughter Anne and daughter-in-law Martha, both teenagers, who served both as lookouts and to throw off attention from neighbors. Until, that is, it was time. October 16th, 1859, Kennedy Farm. There is no more delaying. Brown has heard rumors that they're about to be exposed. The mercenary he'd hired is threatening to rat them out over a pay dispute. And truthfully, there's only so long 20 men can live in a barn attic. Though Harriet Tubman can't be located to spread the word. She's bedridden, but Brown doesn't mm. know that. Still, he simply can't wait anymore. 
They leave before midnight with a wagon full of rifles and pikes, leaving only Owen Brown, his daughters, and two others at the farmhouse. They are to receive and arm the rebel army. He sure will rise when word of the raid gets out. The raiders enter Harper's Ferry by night, cutting telegraph lines and securing bridges. Then the group splits. While Brown's contingent secures the armory, taking the watchman hostage, a second squad enters the home of Colonel Lewis Washington. So let's take a look. I want to show you what this area looks like. This Harper's Ferry is such a very unique place when you visit there just because of where it is geographically. It's pretty neat. So first of all, in terms of where we are geographically, uh, this is the area that we're dealing with right here. It's right where Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia all come together today. But of course, West Virginia didn't exist in 1859. So this is all Virginia right there. Uh, but it's also this place where rivers come together. The Shenandoah River empties into the Potomac River. And it's, so it's kind of like this little triangle area that juts out. And it's also surrounded by high hills on all sides. It's a very narrow area. Uh, and then the armory is right at the tip of all that right here. You can see the railroad bridge that goes across there. You can see there used to be a, a bridge right there. Uh, and right here is where the arsenal is in what's called John Brown's Fort today. And this is what it actually looks like. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, let me drop in and show you a street view here. Give you a little better sense of what this area looks like. You can see the high hills all around. You can see here where the armory is. Very historic area. Really, really cool place to visit. Washington, the great-grandnephew of George Washington, is a politician and planter. They capture him and proceed to inform all of his slaves that they are now free. Also, they take a pair of pistols owned by Lafayette and a sword given to George Washington by Frederick the Great. Wow. By midnight, John Brown is in command of Harper's Ferry. He has prominent hostages, legendary weapons on his hip, and complete control of the situation. Now he needs only to wait for the uprising. But that's precisely when things start to spiral out of control. Elsewhere, a railroad watchman runs into a pair of Brown's raiders guarding a bridge. And when they try to take the watchman prisoner, he escapes, alerting the authorities to mm. what he thinks are a pair of train robbers lying in ambush. Rail employees signal an oncoming train to stop and warn them of the danger on the bridge. But the train's engineer and baggage man disbelieve this report and dismount to walk ahead to get a look for themselves. In the darkness, all they see are men with rifles. Suddenly, the raiders order them to freeze. The engineer and baggage man run, and the raiders fire. And in a sense of twisted irony, the baggage handler, a free black man, is the first person to die in Brown's raid. Wow. Hearing the shoot, train passengers now disembark with their own pistols and begin blazing away at the bridge party who return yeah. fire. You open fire on a train with people on board that were armed. Big mistake. Bizarrely, at this moment, a few Harper's Ferry residents stir, but assuming that it's just a robbery or a railroad strike that doesn't really affect them, they just go back to sleep. And it's around this time that it's Brown's turn to make a bad decision. With not enough men to control the train, he decides to let it through, but also boards it beforehand to inform the conductor that this is not a robbery, mind you, but an abolitionist insurrection. That train will race ahead and wire news of the raid to Washington. Meanwhile, the residents of Harper's Ferry wake to find their town in crisis. As armory workers report for duty, Brown takes them hostage in a small but sturdy fire engine house guarded by Washington's liberated slaves wielding pikes. As word spreads, residents swarm around the building, firing shotguns and pistols. Most had gathered in the saloon that morning to find out what was going on and had been drinking for quite a while at this point. Mm. Then a townsperson is killed by returning raider fire, which increases the public's anger. Militias from the surrounding countryside converge on Harper's Ferry, and Brown's raiders find themselves facing overwhelming fire. And this is before the mili the actual military even arrives. You already have an impossible situation. The only way this was going to be successful was it had to be done quickly and without raising too much alarm in the town. You needed to be able to escape to the countryside where you had the advantage of being able to hide and being able to choose the terrain. You can't let yourself get stuck there and surrounded as more and more and more people arrive. 
The first of his men to fall is Dangerfield Newby, who is hit in the throat with an iron spike that was loaded into a musket. Wow. Everywhere, raiders are retreating. The engine house is taking such heavy fire from a nearby hill that even the hostages worry that they're going to be killed by their own rescuers. Inside, there's talks of forming a truce, and one raider emerges with a hostage to talk terms, but is instead captured. Then a second hostage convinces Brown to try negotiating again, and yells out the door to give the raiders safe conduct. Brown's son, Watson, and another raider emerge unarmed, waving a white flag. They only get a few steps from the door before shots bang out from windows and rooftops. A bullet cleaves into Watson's stomach, and he has to be dragged, whimpering, back into cover. This sight unnerves another raider, so much so that he sneaks to the Potomac River and tries to swim to safety, only making it partway before he himself is mm. hit. The wounded man clings to a rock until militia wade out and shoot him in the head. Wow. It's at this point that Brown realizes the army of liberated slaves is not coming, and the steel trap has snapped shut. His old friend Frederick Douglass had been right. Yep. The Virginians would rather blow him sky high along with his hostages than let him hold Harper's Ferry for an hour. <sighs> yeah, um, this is a serious miscalculation, and this shows you. Remember, Frederick Douglass has been doing this for years. He been, he's been traveling around the country. He's been speaking. He's been meeting with people. He has heard what people have to say. He has seen how entrenched uh, the slave powers are in what they have. Uh, and he knows the lay of the land. John Brown is an idealist. He's a zealot. He's really fueled by his anger and hatred for slavery, so much so that he really can't see things clearly and soberly, and that's his downfall in the end. He's waited too long to escape. It only gets worse when Oliver Brown defending the engine house takes a bullet to the stomach, and then the mayor of Harper's Ferry, finally deciding to see the situation for himself, is killed when the besieged raiders mistake him for a sniper. News of his death unleashes utter fury. Militiamen burst into a building where one of the raiders is being held prisoner and drag him to a bridge. 80,000 will rise to avenge me, he says, and give liberty to the slaves. They shoot him through the forehead. People then start using dead raiders for target practice, and men swarm Dangerfield Newby's body, defiling it and cutting off his ears as keepsakes. Two other raiders die, shot trying to cross the river, and another is captured, though the raiders that can escape do, with two others swimming under the cover of night and the party at the Kennedy farm evacuating as well. So this all seems pretty violent and pretty harsh, even by the standards of warfare, right? But you have to remember that anytime you're dealing with what amounts to civil war, and even though this is on a small scale, that's basically what this is. Civil wars are typically the most violent, the most intimate and ugly as it's described in the movie Lincoln. When you have brother versus brother, when you have former countrymen fighting each other, when you have people who are from the same community or the same region or the same country, but have differing opinions on something that have driven them to violence, it's especially ugly. Now, John Brown is nearly alone. He's surrounded, two of his sons lay dying, and Oliver, his youngest, begs for his father to kill him. And finally, at midnight, e. the U.S. Marines arrive, led by Colonel Robert E. Lee. And you look at that and you see he looks very different than the image we're used to seeing of Robert E. Lee, right? The white hair, the white beard. When the Civil War began in 1861, which is, you know, about a year and a half after this, this is what Robert E. Lee looked like. The pictures we see of him with the white hair, the white beard, looking much older, are later on in the war. Uh, at the beginning of the war, he didn't look like that at all. And John Brown... And I believe that James Longstreet was also one of the officers in that unit. I want to look that up to be sure, though. Okay, so it was Jeb Stewart and Stonewall Jackson who were there and were among the troops who guarded Brown after he was arrested. And John Wilkes Booth was a spectator at the execution of John Brown. So I knew some of the other future Confederates were there as a part of that. So interesting, fascinating stuff. We are gonna dive into part five tomorrow. I'm excited to continue this conversation. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.